Greetings, comrades. Um, today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. Um, later on tonight, I'll be going through an essay um, by a uh, Bolshevik revolutionary called Alexandra Kolontai, and um, she's not a very well-known figure, but you know, one of the drives of this channel is to draw, basically just put the spotlight on some kind of revolutionary figures that many kind of comrades might not be aware of, may not be aware of their work or their ideas, kind of just to, you know, draw a little, take the attention away a little bit from kind of the big mega stars of Marxism towards, you know, some of the other people who are there. And uh, Alexandra Klontai, she was a kind of radical feminist. Um, and, you know, I, I think I have some pretty radical ideas about family and kind of, you know, love and sexuality and things like that. Um, but even today, I, you know, I find her ideas very ahead of her time. But while I was going through um, her essays, I found this really sweet little story. And it's like a, it's almost like a Soviet Christmas story. And it was written in 1922, and it's called Soon, in 48 years' time. Um, so today, I'm going to tell you a Christmas story. 7th of January, 1970. It's warm and bright, and there is a lively and festive atmosphere in the House of Rest, where the veterans of the great years of the World Revolution spend their days. The veterans decided that uh, on the day that had once been Christmas Day, they would recall their childhood and youth by decorating a tree, a real fir tree, just like in the years before the world upheavals. The young children and the older girls and boys were enthusiastic about the idea, especially when they heard that Red Grandmother was going to tell stories about the great years of 1917. There was no problem in getting the tree. They came to an agreement with a man in charge of the forestry conservation, persuading this vigilant guardian of the plant kingdom that the forest would not be ruined by the loss of one stolen tree. Such a strange and unusual festival. The candles were more difficult. The new method of lighting using reflective light rays had not only done away with the kerosene wick lamps once and for all, but had banished electricity to the far and distant provinces where the latest innovations had yet to be introduced. The younger generation had never seen candles, and the veterans of the great years had to explain to them with the help of diagrams. A special conference of people who had been members of the People's Economic Council during the revolutionary period was called to discuss the ways of producing the candles. The young people, with their clever heads and their clever hands, were there to help. After a number of failures, misunderstandings, and unexpected difficulties, they managed to decorate the tree with paper decorations of various colours, with candles, nuts, sweet juicy oranges, rosy apples, and homemade candles, in homemade candle holders. The veterans and the children were unanimously of the opinion that the Commune 10 had not seen such an original and interesting festival for a long time. The young people enjoyed themselves as the young have always done. They laughed and they joked. There were songs, games and dances. But you had to take one look at the girls and the boys to see how they differed from the young people who had fought on the barricades during the great years and from those who lived under the yoke of capitalism. The young people of Commune 10 were healthy and their bodies were fine, supple and strong. The girls had long, luxurious plaits which they arranged carefully. For the commune strictly followed the rule that every member should have time for relaxation and the care of his or her person. The communards loved beauty and simplicity and they did not force or distort nature. The young men dressed in attractive clothes that allowed for free movement. Their hands were obviously strong and able. There was not one sick, pale or exhausted face amongst all the young people who had gathered for the fir tree festival. Their eyes shone brightly and their bodies were strong and firm. Their happy laughter filled the bright festive hall, and there was um, the most joyous change of all. The young people of Commune 10 loved life and loved to laugh. They frowned when it came to battling against the only enemy, nature. However, they did not frown because the struggle was not to their taste, but in order to concentrate better and choose the best way to win. The struggle of men and women to control their environment was still in progress. The more victories they won, the more mysteries there were to be solved. But the young people were not afraid of battle. What would life be like without struggle, with the need to stretch their mind and strive forwards to the unknown and the unattainable? Life on the commune would be dull without it. 
The life of the commune is organised in the most rational way. Everyone has a profession and everyone has some favourite pursuit. Everyone works their own vocation for two hours a day, contributing uh, in this way to the running of the commune. The rest of the time, the individual is free to devote his or her energies to the type of work he or she enjoys, uh, whether it's science, technology, art, agriculture or teaching. Young men and women work together in the same professions. Life is organised so that people do not live in families, but in groups according to their ages. Children have their palaces, the young people have their smaller homes, and adults live together communally in the various ways that suit them, and the old people together in their houses. In the communes there are no rich people and no poor people. The very words rich and poor have no meaning and have been forgotten. The members of the commune do not have to worry about their material needs, for they are provided with everything. Food, clothes, books and entertainment. In return for this individual provides two hours daily work for the commune and the rest of the time the discoveries of creative and inquiring mind. The commune has no enemies for all the neighbouring people and nations have long since organised themselves in a similar fashion and the world is a federation of communes. The younger generation does not know what war is. Young people insisted that the veterans of the great years tell them about battles between the reds and the whites. But the veterans were not anxious to talk about wars on the first on the day of the fir tree. They thought it more appropriate to speak about the leaders of the revolutions. They promised to begin the stories when the candles had burned low and everyone had been given their sweets. Young people hurried to bring the glass trolleys into the hall. The sweets they liked so much were laid out gaily coloured, artistically decorated bowls. The sooner we've had our sweets and the candles on the fur have finished burning, the better, thought the children. But the veterans watched the lights burn low with a sense of sadness. The candles remained them, it is true, of that old and long-forgotten system of capitalism which they had hated so much in their youth. But the past had been ennobled by their great striving for progress. Their dreams had been fulfilled. But the life was now passing them by and their old limbs could not match the bold flights of the young people. Much of the life and many of the aspirations of the young people were incomprehensible to them. Grandad, I know what the word capitalist means, boasted the lively lad who was tucking into a special holiday pie, and I know what a ruble is and what a money is. We saw money in a museum. Did you have money, Grandad? Did you carry it in a little bag in your pocket? And then there were people. Now, what were they called? Thieves. That's right, isn't it? And they took all the money out of the pockets of their comrades. How very strange that must have been. And they all laughed at the strange past. Veterans of the revolution somehow felt awkward and embarrassed about the past, when there had been capitalists and thieves and money and ladies. The last of the candles flickered out, and the trolleys were rolled to one side. The young people gathered impatiently around the storytellers. Grandmother, Red Grandmother, tell us about Lenin. You saw him, didn't you? Did he live like everyone else? Did he eat and drink and laugh? Did Lenin ever look at the stars, Grandmother? These young people had their way of looking at everything. What have the stars got to do with it? When Lenin was alive, there had been so much to do on the earth itself. There had been hunger and exhaustion, war and hunger, hunger and war. A time of suffering and of bloodshed, but also of bravery, self-sacrifice and heroism, and of tremendous faith in the victory of the revolution and the justice of the struggle. Red Grandmother wanted the young people to understand the grandeur of the social struggle, but the young people listened as the veterans had once listened to the Christmas story. Capital, profit private property, front, checker, speculation, soldiers, all of this was so much historical value as vocabulary that the children had heard at school when they were learning about the great years of the revolution. Young people of the world commune are turn their attention to the cosmos. The sky beckons them. They do not understand the grandeur of the old struggles. They cannot appreciate either the excitement or the fears and anxieties of the past. Did you actually shoot people? Shoot at living people? The eyes of the young people showed surprise and sparked with reproach and bewilderment. Life was sacred. We were fighting for our lives, though. We sacrificed everything for the revolution, Red Grandmother said in justification. Just as we dedicate ourselves to the commune, was the proud reply of the young people. Red Grandmother fell silent. Life had forged ahead. The great years were now only history. The younger generation could not respond as they had done to the stories of worldwide barricades and the last fight. The social question was settled. The ideas of communism had justified themselves. Mankind was free from slavery and backbreaking work for others, from material dependence and from the struggle for daily bread. 
New and larger problems confronted humanity, challenging the search and dauntless spirit of men and women. In comparison with these horizons, the previous struggle against social forces seemed to the young people of 1970 an easy question. Hunger? You went hungry? You went hungry? You must have been very disorganised and ignorant. Ignorant, unorganised, young people could pass no sterner judgment on red grandmother's contemporaries. But without us and our firm faith in the triumph of communism, without our fierce and determined struggle against capitalism and the enemies of the workers, you would never have known the benefits of universal organisation and the joy of free creative work. We understand, but our tasks are on an even larger scale. Young people held their heads high, facing the future boldly. They turned their eyes to the stars and the black cloth of the sky, visible through the wide open windows of the festive hall. You achieved your aims, and we will achieve ours. You subdue the social forces, and we will subdue nature. Sing with us, Red Grandmother, the new hymn of the struggle with the elements. You know the tune. It's your own internationale. The words are new. They call us to struggle, to achieve things, to move forward, to let the fir tree burn out. Our festival is in front of us. Our festival is a life of endeavour and discovery. The end. You know, I, I, I find that... It's, it's a really kind of eye-opening look at how at least this individual and perhaps others from the time really thought that kind of the future would be. You know, I think they thought in um, about by 1970 that they almost have achieved, you know, complete communism. And it's, it's quite a strange... Future, I think um, they set out there, <laughs> um, but uh, later I'll be doing kind of a, an analysis of an article by this same woman, and you know that way you'll get a look at just how kind of radical her ideas were and how strange. Anyway, good salutes, comrades. Hope you enjoyed that. <laughs>